uh, first of all, congratulations on Velma. It's quite the interesting watch. Uh, talk about a little bit about the premise and how and why you wanted to tell this story. So Velma is like so close to my heart um, from inception to fruition. She just was like a wild ride. Um, literally, I got like the first line in the film in like a dream. I like dreamed it. And um, I think it's a uh, my therapist says it's one of my compulsions, a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so I was really <laughs> inspired by that. I love therapy, have also been in therapy, <laughs> but I think that the premise of like feminine shame and the fact that like Velma develops this compulsion because of the way that society views sex and sexuality and women and what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. Um, I think that's where her compulsion comes from. And so, yeah, it's just like a very, it's very much inspired by that idea that like as women, you know, we grow up being told things about ourselves, about our sexuality, about what a good woman is. And so that's kind of what I explored with this story. Definitely. And uh, the contrast between the 60s style visuals with a very modern take on this topic, uh, where did that idea come from? And how, how did you uh, convey the the visuals you wanted to your DP. Oh my God. I have an, a wonderful, amazing DP, Justin. Um, we're, we're good friends. We've worked together for a while. He is just wonderful at executing a vision. And he also obviously comes with his own vision and his own wonderful set of like artistry and skill and all those things, but he's so collaborative and we spent like a, a couple meetings going into pre-production just on the visuals. And he came up with a lot of the execution, which I loved. Um, but I knew going in that it was that Velma existed in the late 60s. Uh, it's what I wanted. I think because, as I said before, like women get things put on them and ideas put on them by society, but especially you know, people would say that now it's a lot better than it used to be. So I feel like setting it in the late sixties gives it an even more dramatic weight because it was more prevalent, I think. Um, and I love telling kind of like scary sort of ugly stories in beautiful worlds. So that was the juxtaposition idea was like, cause ugly things can exist everywhere, no matter how beautiful you are, no matter how beautiful your house is, no matter how, gorgeous your outfits are you know you can be very twisted on the inside so definitely and uh i think one of the beauties of, of the way this is shot is how close up you get to your characters and how intimate it feels uh how what, when was that decision made did you get the coverage to be able to pull out or is it was it always something you wanted to do very intimate it was always something i wanted i think in the very very rough first treatment that i sent justin um i wrote lots of close ups <laughs> and it's because i think being that close creates discomfort for like the audience we're like whoa why are we so close and then justin brought the idea of like maybe we never show the men's faces like maybe we like cut them in different ways. Like I knew I didn't want the men to be important. I just didn't know how, <laughs> LOL. I just <laughs> didn't know how I was going to exactly convey that. And Justin came to me with literal like shots and a plan on how to, how to execute that. And it also kind of is cool because it creates this metaphor for her, like taking them apart before we know them, you know? Definitely. Uh, being part of a uh, rebel without a crew, how, how did that help you take on so many hats? Because you, you seem to do so much in your productions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So rebel without a crew was like an incredible um, lesson. It was, it was like film school. Um, we did do everything. We had one crew member who was allowed to be on set with us and help us. So we were doing literally everything. Um, and it, it was, it was, I like to say it was the hardest thing I've ever done and the most fun I've ever had at the same time. And I think it taught me like what I came out of it with was, oh, I can do anything. 
Like, I'm not scared of anything as far as like film and budgets and things like that are concerned. I'm really not afraid because I've been through this really extreme version, which is making a feature for 7K in two weeks, you know? And so if I can do that, then I can bring those lessons to everything I make. And so Velma, Velma was like a really beautiful exercise in like, okay, now I have the time. Now I have the space. Now I have the like the crew, you know, even though it was a small crew, but like I had this really beautiful team to create something above and beyond what I was able to do on Rebel because of obviously the constraints, which were actually wonderful in the way that like within constraints, you have to learn to find your freedom. And Def that's like the most valuable lesson. Definitely. And uh, even though Belmont's a short, uh, it conveys a, a full story in, in, the, in the short amount of time. But is there any plans to extend this? Because it seems like it would be fun to play with this character. It would be so fun. I mean, I think it and I get asked this a lot, but I think Velma very much exists in this medium because, right, we feel the repetition. We're on this ride with her. We're like, what's going to be different next? What's going to happen next? And I don't know. I mean, maybe I would have to develop the character a little bit differently to make it like a feature or a show. I think maybe we, if we made her a feature, it would be like delving into her inner world more and like why and maybe her past. Definitely. And uh, you talked a little bit about the repetition. Uh, there is a bit of repetition, but there's slight differences just the way life is. Um, yes. How, uh, how conscious were you to how this, these little changes happen in, in uh, every repetition and uh, you know, how do you create repetition without it feeling like repetition? <laughs> right, right. So we were very, very conscious of that. And that was another thing that Justin and I were able to collaborate on together was like, how do we make it feel different? What else do we show you? What else do we give you? Because as we move forward with her dates, like we see a little bit more, we get a little bit more, we we just get different like literal angles, right? But also different like headspace for, for each each time we see her do what she's doing. Um, I think it was really important to me to convey that like this, this is a, a coping mechanism for her. This is a compulsion. So there needs to be repetition, but I wanted my audience to stay with me, you know, and to stay with the character. And so you need to give those little bits of change, those little bits of more information, more interest like give me more so that i want more you know definitely and how are you feeling with all the praise that th this short has gotten and all the awards it's won i feel amazing i'm like want to cry thinking about it um <laughs> it, it feels really amazing because when you bring your work into the world when you write and direct and when you act in it right it's so vulnerable it's so it's me it, it's i mean of course it's a character and i'm not velma but like it's very much a huge piece of me. My art is like a huge piece of me. And all you can hope for as an artist, as a filmmaker, is that someone resonates, someone understands, someone gets it, right? And and so through the last, you know, through, through Velma's film festival run, it's just been wonderful to hear that people do get it and that they resonate and that it's it's sending a message, you know? And especially I got um, one of the awards I got was the Banshee Award at Underworlds in Austin, which is a really wonderful horror film festival. And the award was something like, you know, this goes out to the film that screams its message, whether it's uncomfortable or not, like a Banshee would, right? And and that's kind of, that was the point. I wanted to like scream this message that like, what is worse in a woman, right? What do you think is worse? Why is there a sense of relief at the end when you find out what she's doing versus what she, what you thought she was doing, right? Like what's worse. So I don't know. I thought that that, that was a beautiful thing that I got back from those film festivals was people being like, I get it. I hear it. And I, and I like it, you know, which is nice. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, one of the beautiful parts about this film is that you never quite understand who's the villain in this and who's the good, good guy in this. Um, I love that. Thank you. How do you keep that such a secret for almost the entire part <laughs> of the short? Yeah, I think like as so 
this is like going to sound funny, but in acting school, right, you learn that whether you're playing a villain or the good guy, the villain never thinks they're the villain. The villain believes what they're doing is what they need to be doing for the greater good or for their own good or whatever it is. They never see themselves as the bad guy. So I think getting into Velma's inner world so much was the key to keeping her like keeping the audience liking her right you you still you're like oh like you like want her to win you want her to be okay and that's because I think like she is so entrenched in her inner world which is like I I just want to be seen for who I am I don't want to be seen as a sexual object I don't want to be seen as as a pleasure object for someone else I want happiness and I want like the fantasy love definitely um like you said scarlet's not velma velma's not, not scarlet but <laughs> right. how do you connect with her so <laughs> so i grew up catholic um and <laughs> i don't know if if you did but but there's definitely this thing around sin and sexuality and especially for women right literally one of the catholic um, I don't know how, what to call her, but like the Virgin Mary, she's one of the Catholic icons. She's one of the, one of the, the biggest like pieces of worship that there is. And she's, she's a virgin. Right. And like, it's, it's so important that she's a virgin in that, in that religion. And in that realm is like her virginity is her essence is her godliness is her, I mean, not godliness, but you know what I mean? And and I think that's so ingrained in, in women and in young girls. I went to Catholic school, you know what I mean? Like, and, and whether we like it or not, whether we're doing our best, we're ingraining that idea in young girls is that your virginity is like really, really important. And if you lose it and if you have sex, you are bad. There is, you are wrong. Like there is like the stigma around it now, thankfully that's changing, but you know, I grew up, I grew up in the Catholic church, I grew up on the border of Mexico. I grew up like with all of these ideals, like circling and cycling. And so it was of course, very hard not to develop this idea that sex and sexuality in a woman is wrong, you know? And, and now I don't believe that. And I never like consciously believed that, but I think subconsciously that was always like something that was ingrained and, you know, thank God it's changing. Yeah, and, and I, so when people watch this on a uh, video on demand, that that they get that that message, and uh, well, congratulations on this project. It, it's Thank fantastic. You. you you did an amazing job, and I can't wait to see what else you come up with. Thank you so much, Jesus. I'm excited. I um, we just finished. We just wrapped another short film. Um, my friend Josh Stifter and I co-directed and co-wrote a film called Little Lucha and the Big Deal. I actually met him on Rebel. He was one of the other filmmakers. So everyone can look out for that next. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Have a great day.